So next up, we have Roy, who has been at a lot of conferences that I've organized. Roy gives a fantastic talk, uh, and he'll be talking specifically about his experience implementing GraphQL in the tech stack for the city of Amsterdam, which sounds like a pretty darn cool hmm. uh, gig, to be totally honest. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to him so I can get started here just about as on time. And the uh, floor is yours. Hey, thank you, Jesse. So yeah, hi all. Nice to be here. So yeah, I'll be talking about GraphQL for cities and also GraphQL for other public organizations because um, probably not all of you are working for your local city and maybe you're working for other public organizations, maybe for health organizations or like uh, big banks or insurers that also are considered public organizations. So who's this actually for? So one of the things we noticed when I started working at the city of Amsterdam is that open sourcing is more than just uh, putting all your code in GitHub and, and just put it on there without any additional information. It's something a lot of companies do. They're saying, hey, we're open sourced, but then again, they just put all their code in GitHub without any documentation, which makes it really hard for other people to understand and value your code. So that's something to understand before starting this stuff. So a little bit about myself. So just you already introduced, I'm working for the city of Amsterdam where we create all sorts of open source APIs, uh, web applications, and also GraphQL, which I'll talk to you about later. I also teach React and GraphQL for the React GraphQL Academy, and I work with some other companies. But next to this, you can also find me on Twitter, where I tweet a lot about React, JavaScript, TypeScript, and of course, GraphQL. So Amsterdam, so maybe Amsterdam, like, uh, this talk is being recorded in multiple time zones. So today, so at this moment, we're recording um, also in the US and you might not know Amsterdam. Although Amsterdam is pretty fam f famous, I guess. But Amsterdam is a city in Europe, uh, in the in the country Netherlands, and it has been there for a long time. So we're almost 800 years old and we almost have a million people. So maybe Amsterdam sounds really big. It isn't that big. It's just like 860,000 people which isn't that much if you uh, compare it to London, which is pretty close, which is like over 10 million people. And just to make sure I'm not working for Amsterdam in the US, because apparently there is a city of Amsterdam in the US as well. So last fall I was visiting Washington and I was trying to find the time to go to the city of Amsterdam in Washington, or at least close to Washington, but I couldn't find the time. And just to be sure the city of Amsterdam in uh, the US, it's, it's, way, it's way newer. And it's pretty far away. It's like almost 4,000 miles or like 6,000 kilometers if you're from Europe. And we're known for a lot of stuff. Uh, like probably you've seen beautiful canals or uh, all the old uh, kennel homes. And of course, cheese. And we also have particular drugs that a lot of people know us for, unfortunately. Uh, but we also do tech. So if you don't know this about Amsterdam, Amsterdam is a really big tech up in Europe. Actually, it's considered to be one of the major uh, European uh, tech hubs. And you can see this it's from um, some figures that I collected for you. So in 2017, we had like 60,000 people um, being employed by tech companies, which is, which, is pretty, um, which is pretty good because it's almost 11% of the total labor market in Amsterdam. So you can consider Amsterdam a big city. It's like 860,000 people. And we have 60,000 people working just in tech. So... And it's even growing every day because more and more companies are going to Amsterdam, especially with the whole Brexit scenario. You can already see a lot of companies moving from London to Amsterdam, um, or maybe that even to Berlin or Paris. But Amsterdam is pretty is pretty popular among startups that are coming from other countries. And this tech um, this tech uh, hype, you can also see their local government. So the city of Amsterdam is clearly investing in tech because we have a lot of problems we want to tackle. Uh, by using tech. And some of these problems I can um, I can show you later on, uh, but most of the tech is being tackled from one, um, yeah, from one department. And sorry for this image, it's in Dutch. Uh, but basically it's saying uh, the department is called Research, Information and Statistics. And one part of that uh, is the part that I'm working for, and it basically handles data. So we're going to use all the research data, all the information from the city and statistics, and we're going to extract the data and put it into uh, web applications, into APIs, basically making it available to the world. Um, 
but most of all make it available to the people that are using it, like civil servants, people that live in Amsterdam, um, or even researchers for our universities. And basically this uh, department is making sure that all those, um, all those numbers are available somehow. Like it could be a web application, it could be like to extract data sets, it could be the public APIs I mentioned. And we also like to share knowledge. We should like to share a lot of knowledge because every every Thursday we run a meetup. Uh, there are a lot of internal demos. There are demos at universities, at other places in town. So this is one of those demos. It's like um, a large part of the department that works on uh, our applications and APIs, basically showing what they've built, showing new technologies, showing how to get started with something. And when I just started over there, one of my first like internal demos was showing how to use GraphQL. Because GraphQL was already a hot topic. Some people were actually considering using it. But somehow they didn't really felt the need to do it because maybe some information was, le was uh, lacking in the organization. Or maybe some people just didn't like the concepts because REST is like a contract. So why make some GraphQL API that people might abuse? So these are all uh, concepts that you need to take away whenever your organization isn't using GraphQL already because probably they are really stick to REST APIs and they need to know the differences. They need to understand how GraphQL can actually help other people use your APIs and use your APIs in a way that they can actually create something out from it. And like I told you, we're developing our projects not only for the world, but mostly for our civil servants, for our researchers, and also for civilians. So we want to be sure that all the data that Amsterdam has, is it about you, your neighborhood, or maybe the company you work for, if the data is public, we want you to be able to see the data, to even use it for your own good or do whatever it uh, what you want to do because it's all open public data. So it should be shared with the world and it should be accessible for people to use um, and make um, yeah make cool applications or other things from. And it's basically this entire department is based on three pillars. So the biggest pillar is data because there's a lot of data um, is being harvested all over the city, um, like from uh, we have sensors under the roads, in the streets. There are probably cameras everywhere. I'm not sure if it's good or bad to have cameras all over your city, but uh, yeah, consider something goes wrong, then you're happy to have cameras. Consider, um, yeah, it's it has two ways. It's two sides, like having cameras everywhere, but at least it generates a lot of data. And some of the things we do with our department is uh, is um, using the harvested data and make information that people can use from it. So. You want the data to be translated to information that everyone can read and understand and can do something with. Another part is knowledge. So we want all this knowledge that we gather from the information, from the data. Uh, we want the knowledge to share it with the world, we want it to be available for everyone, uh, maybe in stories or maybe uh, with meetups or videos or by going to other departments and showing what's actually possible with all the information we have over there. So those are actually the three pillars this entire department is built upon. And like I told you, every city is facing problems, like every organization is probably uh, facing problems and those problems can be real good and the problems can be real big and they can be really small. So probably you're living in a city as well or maybe in a small village, then I guess you're lucky because you don't have to deal with all the big world problems from there. Uh, but some of the problems we're facing in Amsterdam um, in these beautiful canals is tourists. As you can imagine, a lot of people want to visit those beautiful canals. They want to see Amsterdam. They want to eat or cheese. They maybe want to um, go there for the drugs or the parties as well. And this is actually one of the most popular areas in Amsterdam. And uh, something we did over here is placing crowd control monitors everywhere. So the city can know how many people are in a certain street at each point of the day. And it's it's a pity I couldn't find the graph uh, easily because it's, no, it was somewhere else. But you can see in this area, that's actually purely based on tourists. It's almost empty now because due to the entire situation that we're also talking remotely with each other right now, um, this city is almost empty now because one of the things that tourists brings along, it's like people don't want to live in a tourist area because they want to live somewhere nice and quiet where they can actually enjoy their day and uh, do their work. And one of the things you see in those very crowded places that people start living there again and everything starting up. So this problem was actually handled for us by uh, external means. Um, but we also create applications to handle these, these problems ourselves. So that's why we use the crowd monitoring. So you can actually uh, monitor uh, how busy certain areas are and then take measures to get rid of some of the um, 
some of the maybe dangerous uh, crowds. And something else we face is trash. There's a lot of trash everywhere and people start putting trash everywhere, especially if you have tourists, they leave trash everywhere in particularly because they somehow don't <laughs> seem to find where the trash bins are. And how to solve these problems. So like I told you, we gather all data about these problems and so we can handle them effectively. And one of the ways to handle those problems is putting signs everywhere. And in the end, you just want people to know what you can and can't do somewhere else. You need to be in English. Um, although, your, although the language in the Netherlands is Dutch, we need to put on signs everywhere in English. But another way to handle problems is technology. And that's why we created all those public APIs, uh, those web publications. We created maps that you can use. So this is an example of some of the public APIs we have. And I don't know if you can actually see, but on the right, you can see the license. So we have different sort of licenses for our APIs because some APIs contain, um, contain information that's not for everyone. They need to have certain authorization in there because you don't want everyone to see an API like who are your neighbors, how much money they make each year. But that would be interesting to see, but that's something we want to protect people from because the APIs are public, the code is public, but not all the data is public. So most of the data is public, but some data isn't. So that's why we have different licenses for each API. Um, but in there, there are over 35 public APIs. And those are just uh, usually just REST APIs. Some GraphQL, but most of them are REST APIs. And there are also uh, map layers in there or uh, even map servers. There are data sets that you can extract. Um, and this is all public information. I'll share the links with you later so you can have a look. And everything is open, like I told you. So maybe not all the data is open, but most of the stuff is actually open. You can find it on our GitHub as well. So if you would go to github.com and slash Amsterdam, you can already find like over 200 projects that are running right there, which are the APIs I mentioned. There's also applications or map servers or small services running somewhere and even some NPM packages. So one thing we did like a year ago, we started uh, extracting small bits of code that we create and open source them to the world. So you can ask why, why are we actually doing this? That's because we want to enhance collaboration and we want to be transparent. Like as a government, you want to be transparent to your people. You want to know what information you have about them, like how they can exit it. And also we want it to be reusable. So as we're uh, a local government, we're being, um, our budgets are coming from tax and tax is paid by people living in the city. So people in the city don't want to um, want developers like me to create a lot of code for a lot of their tax money and not think about reusability. So that's something we like to do in our open source, um, in our open source approach. And if you want to know more about this approach, it's like an entire manifest uh, that you can see on this website, where you can find out more about what do we think about collaboration, transparency, reusability, and even some more topics that are all uh, included in the whole open source debate. And also, like, of course, we follow European guidelines for open standards because we also work together with other cities, which is quite cool. Like some of our NPM packages are also used by other cities like Finland or Norway uh, or even Belgium, which is a bit closer to the Netherlands. And so if you're in the US, you probably have no idea which some of these countries are. Um, but yeah, it's uh, a lot going on in Amsterdam and the rest of Europe in terms of open source development. So what I'm working on uh, is most of all the open data portal of the city of Amsterdam. So this data portal, basically it combines all the information that you can find about the city of Amsterdam through our APIs, through services or data sets on one website. And this website has um, information about data, it has the data itself, it has interactive map applications. It is basically everything you can think about um, that you're, if you're looking at a city, like what kind of data can a city have about me? Like all those data can be found in this site. And this portal combines all the open data, uh, but it also uses all the public APIs that we just showed you. But if you know about REST, uh, like I told you, REST is a contract. And if you have a contract with someone to use all the data, you can imagine that if you're doing something particular with the data, then a REST API might not be the best solution for this. And that's why we started using GraphQL in our application. And we use GraphQL in a way uh, like you would know for backends for frontends something that we built on top of the public APIs just to make sure that we only get the information we need 
And we don't need to load like several APIs every time uh, we start using um, a new public API in our application. And this backend for front end, or you can call the data layer. Uh, you can also, there are multiple ways to call this. It's like uh, inside of us, inside of our application, we usually call it um, like the search layer or the data layer. And basically what it does, it's using the graph approach of GraphQL, like you know GraphQL, it's about graphs. Uh, and we're using it for public API. So every public API um, can be wrapped to represent a graph. And using those graphs, you can bring those graphs together. And there are multiple ways to bring graphs together. So you probably have all heard about Apollo Federation or um, like all the other approaches to bring certain graphs together, like remote schemas. Uh, there are multiple ways to bring together graphs. So in our application, we chose to go with a monolith for now uh, because we're just starting this. Um, and we were the only team using those public APIs. But in the end, you can imagine we are the only team using those uh, specific GraphQL uh, layers. But you can imagine if we build more applications and you want stuff to be reusable, that we need to start thinking about something, either remote schema stitching or maybe a pull of federations to bring together the graphs for every public API. But if you want to look at um, the architectural um, overview, I'll show it to you later. Uh, but most of all, let's look about what a data access layer or a data layer, how actually you can define this data layer that we have. So there's a small definition for this that I took from the internet and it's probably, uh, yeah, it's talking about a data access layer, which is just a very common computer science approach to um, harvest multiple, uh, multiple sites of data into one access layer that can be used by software or an application, a computer program, whatever you want to call it. So if you look at the architecture for this, it basically looks like this. So on the left, we have our open data portal. Um, and on the right, you can see that we're using public APIs. And those public APIs, they're doing multiple things. So sometimes public API is just getting data from a database. Sometimes it's getting data from other services. So you can imagine that we also use APIs from uh, other public organization in the Netherlands, like our health organization or uh, some departments of the national government. And we want to have all those services and databases, imports, experts. Uh, we have public APIs for them. And so every API, you could wrap the, every API with GraphQL and just like this. So you would have two schemas for every public API would have their own schema. And I don't know how pretty how much you know about the usage of GraphQL in API environments. Like uh, this is one approach, like using the multiple schemas per API. What we did, we used data loader. And with GraphQL data loader, you can actually use, um, yeah, you can use data loader to create loaders for every API. So what we've did, we've created a loader for every API. So one API could be to get information about a certain data set. Another API could be to get information about uh, public records from uh, maybe a home or maybe like a public office of the city. And we wrap those things in data layers, or you can also wrap them in, um, into your own GraphQL APIs. And then you can actually read those data from a, read those data from a data layer. So we have this data layer is using multiple GraphQL APIs or just one GraphQL API, and it's bringing everything together. Because all those APIs, they need to be read, they need to be normalized. Um, sometimes they're built by different teams. So this data layer is picking up all the hard work for us and is actually normalizing the data, putting it all together and making it available for our front end or our web application to be readable. And this is basically because all those public APIs, they have their own schemas, they have their own um, way of working and that's one downside you have with large with large organizations so you want to have an api that's being that could be able to be used by as much uh, as much other people as possible but on the downside like making stuff generic making it to be used by a lot of people um, it's often very hard to use it for a specific uh, specific need and especially if you bring together multiple apis that are uh, being built for the world and you just want to use them in the small applications, um, then GraphQL would be a real good solution. But unfortunately for us, it wasn't possible to create all those public APIs, uh, both as a REST API and a GraphQL API because, because of many, uh, many reasons. So that's why we actually built this data layer that is using GraphQL for those different public APIs, bring it together in our data layer that we can use uh, however we see fit. 
and then read that from the um, from the front end that we built. So some something we're working on now is making this data layer approachable for other people as well. So you can imagine that if you're of public APIs with REST calls, that some of those calls need to be combined every time just to get like a proper information. So in our application, you can you can have interactive maps. You can click somewhere on the map and you need to load data. And the data needs to be loaded from multiple public APIs. So you don't want to send around all those requests. And if you look at our um, at our code base, we have multiple applications doing uh, this kind of logic. So one of the things you're working on right now is creating sort of an API client for all those public APIs, which again will be a data layer based on GraphQL. And for us, that's a real good way to, um, on one hand, make public APIs that are available to the world and can fit like a thousands of needs. And on the other hand, uh, make a GraphQL API that can be used by specific applications just to get small parts of uh, different APIs or services and bring them all together so they can be used however the application sees fit. So for us, that was like the uh, the biggest difference by using GraphQL over REST. So tailoring those public APIs to user needs is something you can't do with REST. And that's where really GraphQL shows its strength and how it can help organizations to, um, yeah, to make real use of their public APIs that are maybe used by somewhere else. And you can't just uh, deprecate a public API like that because maybe uh, someone built this entire company around it, or maybe a department that doesn't have the tech, the tech people to, to build a new application based on that API. So GraphQL for us really is a way to tailor public APIs to user needs, which is something that probably every large or at least every public organization with public APIs um, can, can be helped by this approach. So can't this be done with, uh, without GraphQL? That's probably a question you get a lot by backend developers because most backend developers I like, uh, I know, um, they're really not open to the concept of GraphQL because they like the concept of having a contract with the REST API. So of course you can build just your own backend for front end for, um, for one web application and don't use GraphQL, but then you're actually gonna fall into the same, uh, the same problems again, because if you make a backend for front end for one application, then maybe the other week or the other year or in a few months, another department in your organization might want to make another application that's using specific APIs and they will also build their own backend for front end, uh, which might also not be based on GraphQL. So maybe those um, those two backend for front ups could be combined and with GraphQL, you can still harvest all the, um, yeah, all the clear examples and all the clear, um, yeah, the clear upsides of GraphQL without having to um, to create a lot of code that is isn't reusable um, and all everything needs to be um, yeah it takes a lot of time to maintain all those different APIs and different backends for frontends and in the end you would still have the problem that you have public APIs you have private backend for frontends and you have a lot of backend for frontends they're all tied to certain applications with GraphQL we can really solve this problem in our organization at least. So if you want to learn more about this, there are multiple ways to um, to do so. Um, because one thing I like to I like you to do is just if you're um, if you like to know more about open source for cities, just really go to the uh, to the website of the city of Amsterdam or the GitHub page I showed you later. Let me get this slide over here. Yeah. So the first link I have over here is really the Amsterdam GitHub where you can find our manifest. And in here we explain why open source actually um, why it takes a big part in the organization and why we've chosen to go open source. And on our GitHub page, you can then find, uh, on our actually GitHub repository page, you can find all the projects that we created. And here you can find public APIs, like I told you, you can find map services, you can find web applications. Uh, but most of all, you can also find uh, some GraphQL APIs in here. And yesterday I had a meeting with one of the other people that's working on a very large data processing application inside the city of Amsterdam. And they actually managed to use GraphQL for streaming data. So that's even more interesting. So there's a lot of interesting stuff happening with GraphQL in our organization. And basically it all started just by um, having multiple internal demos showing how to use GraphQL and making people excited within the organization because that's in the end um, what this should be about, right? You can't have people in your organization use GraphQL, whether it's a city or a large company, without being enthusiastic about it. So 
The biggest thing, if you want your organization to start using GraphQL, just get everyone excited about the technology, about what you can do with it. Maybe try to create small demos, show through small interactions how people uh, can use those technologies. And yeah, just try to create uh, an environment where people want to learn and want to try new things. And then you will see if you're building APIs that have very specific needs uh, or very broad needs, you can maybe combine them with GraphQL and make them open, open to the world or open to at least some parts of your organization by using GraphQL to wrap, to wrap them all together. So that's most of the things I like to I wanted to talk with you about today. So as we hadn't that much time, I there's tons of other things I could tell you about GraphQL and how we're actually using it. But yeah, just go to the code examples. And if you want to know more about me, uh, maybe we have some time to ask questions, or you can find me on Twitter as well. Or just make sure to watch some of my talks at uh, at YouTube and have a look over there. Thank you. Thank you, Roy. That was great. We don't have any time for questions. <laughs> There's uh, this this community. It's so passionate about their topics and uh, about the GraphQL, and uh, they they filled in the the talk time quite well. Um, great talk. I mean, talk about a, a massive system to try to model inside of GraphCMS and represent data that is both actionable as well as representative of the the system. So. Uh, great talk. Really appreciate you coming on. And uh, if you have any questions, definitely feel free to uh, message him directly or on Twitter. Uh, and he's got a lot of talks on YouTube that are, are full of great content. Mm -hmm. So definitely check those out. So thanks, Roy. Yes. Thank you all for listening. <laughs>